Welcome to Reporters Uncensored, RUTV. I'm your host, Tala Dilad Shahi. Thanks for joining us. Our global team of reporters bring you those human interest stories not covered in the mainstream media. This week, we're launching a new mini-series on social innovators. Each of these individuals in this series has achieved high-impact results in their own unique way. We're going to share their success stories and talk about how they approach the problems with initiative, innovation, and exciting solutions. Tonight, we profile Bill Drayton, founder and CEO of Ashoka. Bill is a lifelong entrepreneur and has helped build the field of social entrepreneurship for over 25 years. And he remains committed to shaping a dynamic global citizen sector. Since 1981, Ashoka has elected over 2,000 leading social entrepreneurs as Ashoka Fellows, providing them with living stipends, support, and access to a global network of peers in over 60 countries. Let's take a look at a clip on how Ashoka works. Ashoka, Innovators for the Public, is a global organization that searches out and supports social entrepreneurs, men and women who use entrepreneurial vision and skills to attack and solve social problems. We're only talking about people who cannot come to rest until their vision has become the new pattern society-wide. Ashoka is a community of over 1,500 social entrepreneurs, plus staff members, partners, and volunteers in over 50 countries who work together to create widespread, long-lasting change. Bill Drayton is its founder. You've got to have a vision that's going to change the field. You've got to be equally concerned with the how-tos. How do you get from here to there? In this program, Bill Drayton describes how social entrepreneurs think and act. How the burgeoning field of social entrepreneurship is making a profound impact on millions of lives. And how everyone can contribute to its growth. The entrepreneur and the idea are so closely tied together that the life cycle of an idea and the entrepreneur is very hard to separate. Now, of course, an entrepreneur can live beyond the launch of an idea. Similarly, the idea can live long after the entrepreneur. Jean Monnet, I think, was the second most brilliant person of the last century. He was responsible for the unification of Europe. His basic dynamic in Europe idea, institution, stronger idea, next institution, more momentum and credibility for the idea. He died in 1979. That dynamic is still going on. That's his, that's his core genius, in my mind, is setting that dynamic in place. So the, the person and the idea are married, uh, but especially once you get beyond this stage of defining and figuring out how to make it work at scale, then they can have independent lives. One of the Ashoka fellows in Brazil saw that half the people in a relatively rich state, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, had no electricity in the rural areas. And he wanted to change that. So he developed a new approach to rural electrification that cut the cost 70 to 90 percent. And then he went to work to change it. And he had to talk to the engineering firms and get financing structured and so on. That's changed the lives of way over a million people and spreading. He's now focusing on how do you get solar energy into the hands of people who are not wealthy. And there are hundreds of millions of people across the world who can benefit from that. J.B. Schramm, right here in Washington, is one of the, was one of the first U.S. Ashoka Fellows. He has a very simple idea, but one that will have a big impact. He went to college. Most of his classmates didn't. That bothered him because he knew that they were just as smart, and he thought this was wrong and a big waste. He had parents who went to college. They didn't. This is not what should make the difference. Classic for an entrepreneur, he kept that idea in his mind's eye. He kept thinking about it, looking at it, feeling his way to an answer. He had to find an answer that would be low cost and simple and a big win for all the actors. Classic entrepreneur's criteria. 
he set up something called College Summit. And the way it works, he takes a peer group of high school students from families that do not have college backgrounds, and they spend four or five days at a college summit on a nearby campus. College is demystified. They're challenged from the first moment to think about their lives, to articulate the strengths of what they've done, to write the essays for getting into college. They're talking with people who are role models. He then works with the homeroom teachers. Now, this works. 80% of the kids go, 80% graduate. Now, this is a very simple idea, but it has to be implemented. And he's now at the stage of moving it out across the country. That's a social entrepreneur at work. I'm joined now by Bill Drayton from Ashoka. Welcome, Bill, to the it's program. It's a real pleasure. Uh, that was a great overview. There are so many problems in the developing world. And from all the shows that we've had, you know, a lot of the criticism about showing developing world shows is that there aren't any solutions. You know, there's human trafficking, there's corruption, there's disease, there's poverty. Collectively, what kind of impact do, do Ashoka Fellows have on these critical issues? Well, we, we actually measure the impact at the end of five years. And we've now done this for nine years. We just got the most recent results yesterday. And it's very consistent. So at the end of five years, after the idea and entrepreneur launch, 97% are continuing full-time pursuing the goal. 90% have seen independent institutions copy their idea. And over half have already changed national policy. Hmm. That's more important than it sounds because you know, many people number. don't need to change national policy. To see, it's very surprising, actually. Five years is early when you're introducing a fundamental pattern change. And it's, especially in a democratic society, things move more slowly. They're designed to because you've got to get everyone to agree. So uh, if you give yourself permission, you can change the world. And I... I it's not just the great entrepreneurs, all of us. But most of us are constantly being told, no, 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 you can't do this. But if everyone who is with us today looked around, I'm sure they'd be able to say, I see a problem there. That's not going to be the problem, finding a problem. And even a problem you really care about. So why don't they go and do it? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at what the, the great entrepreneurs do, it's not rocket science. They just solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, if you and I and everyone said, we can do that, and we just kept at it, we could. And that's the world we need to go to. Everyone a change maker, not just a small elite. And what about a country example? Like, can you give us a clear example of where there has been a phenomenal problem and, and Ashoka Fellow has tried to address it, has come, come up with a solution. You know, the one thing that comes to my head, Bill, right now is the Congo. You hear so much about exploitation of resources and that the African country is always going to be having problems because it's part of its history. There won't be solutions. I mean, what's a country example that you could give us that, well, you know, we tackled that problem and this is the solution? Well, first of all, about Africa, we actually find a higher proportion of people we can elect as leading social entrepreneurs in Africa mm -hmm. than the population would suggest versus the rest of the world. Oh, wow. Uh, now, there are a lot of reasons. It may be partly because other avenues are closed, not very attractive, but it's certainly not a lack of talent. And I, th I think we're seeing a new generation coming of professional age that is going to change this picture. Uh, now, I, let me give you an example. We, we saw J.B. Schramm in the introduction. That's a U.S. fellow making it possible for all high school students to get into and do well at college. Let me give you a Bangladeshi case. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim Soban. Uh, seventh grade education, family, no, res no, very, very poor rural family. It's a really tough country. Well, he has found and put in place a series of changes that according to UN measurements has led to a 44 percent 
increase in rural school enrollments and the dropout rate being cut in half. Mm -hmm. Now, when he started, only 15, one five percent of the kids were making it into the fifth grade. This is a very bleak future. Now, he is having a profound impact, and his model has moved to Brazil and other countries through the Ashoka Network. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the things he does. There are several pieces to this. Mm -hmm. Instead of the teacher coming, calling the roll, uh, grading the papers, and only having seven or eight minutes to teach and give the next night's uh, exercises, Teacher comes, calls roll, teaches. Kids leave classroom and sit in circles outside of eight or nine kids. Whoever did best in the month before leads that group. They do the exercises, they grade them. Those who got it right help those who didn't. Teacher goes from group to his group as a resource. No homework. So that the poor kids who don't have tutors, whose parents can't help them, who probably can't even afford kerosene, don't fall behind and drop out. Well, there's, well, there's more to it. It's very simple. Now, if you think about that principle with a modest adaptation, that would work right here in New York City. Or globally. I mean, it's really about exactly. coming up with simple solutions to tackle just the problems little by little. It's always like it seems that, you know, these are these massive problems and everyone wants to tackle them in, in one go. But if we just kind of nail at them a little bit, you know, just hammer them out a little by little by little, we can actually make changes, but they're small steps. Well, you know, um, think about the advantages you and I and probably 98% of the people who are with us this evening have had compared to Ibrahim. Now, if he can do that, why can't we? Mm -hmm. Of course we could. Mm -hmm. He just gave himself permission. It's amazing. I mean, it was a really... Um, really really touching video now about multinational corporations this is the big phrase um, they operate a lot in the developing world they clearly have their own agenda and their goals and you hear a lot about the Clinton Global Initiative trying to bring in these private public partnerships um, do you have any success stories of multinationals which are often deemed to be very corrupt and have their own agenda working successfully with Ashoka Fellows on sustainability projects yeah, ab absolutely. Um, uh, you know, there, there are the tobacco companies are killing lots and lots of people. It's unconscionable. Uh, it's a huge embarrassment to us among citizen groups that you know our government is forcing other governments to allow these companies to advertise. I mean, it's just a scandal. So there are some really bad things going on. Mm -hmm. But in general. Uh, not surprisingly, most people want to contribute for the good. What, what is the core human drive in life? It's to express love and respect in action. Now, that applies to everybody. So let me give you some examples of the opportunities of working together with business. And, and this, is, this is really important because business took off and became entrepreneurial and competitive 300 years before the citizen sector did historical accident, but it, that's the fact. 1980, the citizen sector shifted, and we've been catching up in productivity and scale and now globalization, so that you have the two halves of society, same architecture, getting closer and closer together. So although we still wear different clothes and don't really like one another always so much, mm -hmm. in fact, you can put together a new way of working together that produces a huge productivity gain for everyone. An example, uh, about half the land area, agricultural land area of Mexico is small farmers. They do not get drip irrigation. It's not profitable for the companies, and the government's never been able to do it for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons, corruption, whatever. So why, does it, why is it the companies aren't selling? Well, their cost structure is too high. They don't understand rural Mexico. Oh, well, in the last five or ten years, what's happened? Large citizen groups that are very competent have come up all over rural Mexico. It's true around the world. Now, they have a low cost structure appropriate to rural Mexico. They want to serve the farmers. There is trust two ways. Oh, they're not very good at making pipes. 
Well, if you put these two things together, you have a system that will allow the companies to sell to the other half of the agricultural land area of Mexico, which is a big deal for the companies. The farmers in a dry area that get one crop, maybe if the rains don't fail, now they can get two or three crops steadily. In a dry area, you're conserving water because drip irrigation does that. Mm -hmm. And the citizen group is serving their client, and they're getting the markup for serving the marketing, the sales, the technical assistance, all the sort of grassroots steps. Now, neither the business nor the citizen group could do that alone. Together, you have what we call, let's use the phrase, a hybrid business social value-added chain. Now, you could do that, and we're demonstrating that in many different industries, slum construction, uh, health care delivery. Now, th so the, the opportunity right now for the sectors to work together and create a new type of institution that is neither a business nor a citizen organization, and, you know, this requires a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. Well, it really gives me hope. Um, young people, they're creative. Uh, they're imaginative. They are. They have a lot of energy. Uh, how can we work to, or in what ways does Ashoka work to engage young people? Our, the, the world cannot get to where it has to go unless we change what happens with young people. So that all young people are powerful as young people right now. The elite kids who go to the very best schools are encouraged to do that. But in 98% of the schools in the U.S., middle and high schools, the adults say, oh, we're in charge of everything. Stay out of the way. You're not very competent, not very responsible. And, well, how on earth do you expect young people to master the core skills that they have to have as an adult in a world where change is not only fast now, but is literally escalating at a logarithmic rate, which it is. Mm -hmm. So a 15-year-old today who doesn't master the core skills to be a change maker, where are they going to be 15 years now when they're 30? Nowhere. In big trouble. That's what we're, 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 we're allowing that to happen. It's, it's, it's absolutely a crime. Now, if the U.S. or Mexico or any country is going to succeed, what is the key factor for success in 5, 10, 15 years? It's what proportion of the population are change makers and how well do they work together? The same thing is true for a city, an ethnic group, a company, whatever. Why is Silicon Valley taken off and Detroit and so many other cities that were the core of the American economy wither away? Well, if you're a great change maker, where will you go? Are you going to go to Sioux City, with all due respect to Sioux City, or are you going to go to Palo Alto? You're going to go to Palo Alto. Why? Because the other change makers are there. And the, and the institutions in Silicon Valley or Bangalore are competing to get you to come and work for them because that's the key factor for success for them. So they're rapidly evolving into a team of teams part of an ecosystem of a team of teams where everyone has to be a player. You don't have a team of people or cogs. A team is everyone is a player. And in a world of rapid change, what does that mean? They have to be change makers. So you cannot get there. The U.S. will be Detroit and not Silicon Valley if the young people of today, 12-year-old, 15-year-olds, don't give themselves permission and everyone else take the barriers out of the way oh, I have an idea for a tutoring service or a virtual radio station mm -hmm. or a dance academy. It doesn't matter. You have a dream. You build a team. You leave your school or neighborhood better. You do that, you'll be a change maker for life. And furthermore, you'll be bringing 20 or 25 other kids with you. You have a radio, virtual radio station. Who's broadcasting from 3 to 6 on, on Thursday? Someone's got to be there, so you've got to recruit them. Well, you know, by the time you get four or five successful teams in middle school, you've got 100 kids recruiting, coming and joining us, and, and then you're, you're training the new kids how to do it, and you're marketing to all the other kids. Well, this is, this, is the, this is how a revolution happens. You change the youth cultures from ones where people don't have these skills, where it's normal, it's expected. 
and yeah. they get active and they and they try to create change you know we have a few chats here bill and i wanted to kind of look at one of them david says uh, successful smaller innovations will spark the insights upon which massive massive systematic changes can and should be based so again we go back to even being 12 or 15 if you try to do those small projects to get change makers involved in your project you can actually build on that and 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 create Absolutely. massive but if you, if you look at the entrepreneurs today business or social ask them when was the first time you started and built something and they'll tell you when i was 14 i did whatever it was mm -hmm. now this is not an accident to be a great change maker, entrepreneur, as an adult, you have to start. Now, the other point is uh, there, there, there are three levels of contribution. Giving people fish when they're starving, that's important. Helping a group of people learn how to fish, that's important. The third level is revolutionizing the, chip, the fishing industry. Now, Every time you start on that third level, which is where the real leverage is, uh, of course you have to start in one community, and then you've got to make it work and refine it, and then you've got to build an institution, and then you've got to help other people see it. Mm -hmm. So this is amazing the stuff. big idea is always start practically. You've got to make it work in one place. And they start young. So the young folks out there listening and watching the show, start thinking now. Uh, unfortunately, I wish we could sit with Phil all night, but that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, join us next week when we will feature Filmade International. Tune in to Livestream.com, Blip TV, and look at our blog on the Huffington Post Weekly. It will give you all the information on RUTV, news and information that's good for you. Thanks again. Good night.